Thank you, LockNets, for the opportunity to talk a little bit about my favorite topic, which is neuroendocrine tumors. I'm really privileged to be here today. So I think it's really essential for us to talk a little bit about the surgical implications for patients that are diagnosed with neuroendocrine tumors. And I thought it would be uh, just a good idea to walk through some of the tips that I talk with my patients about when they come into the office to see me for the first time. So I always start off with a little bit about neuroendocrine tumors because it really is important for us to understand how rare these, this disease is and why it's so critical for us to seek out expertise. So there are only about 12,000 new neuroendocrine tumor patients diagnosed in each year in the United States. And so that represents far less than 1% of all cancers diagnosed uh, in the United States. What that means is it's a very rare disease and the person that's often giving you the news or making the call that you do have a cancer may not have ever seen this disease or ever treated this disease. Because it's so rare, uh, it's, it's oftentimes associated with a delay in diagnosis. Uh, we always describe uh, neuroendocrine tumors as zebras because they're relatively uncommon. And most people think of horses, whereas neuroendocrines are usually really not thought about when people see masses or when patients present with symptoms. Again, because it's so rare, uh, your, your initial practitioner may be unfamiliar with how it's treated. And so the number one uh, piece of advice that I give patients is you really need to be treated at a high volume center because the expertise and understanding what your cancer is and how it behaves is really important to making sure that you have the very best outcome. Additionally, neuroendocrine tumors are uh, by definition a multidisciplinary disease. Uh, it's very rare that the single person that you see is going to be able to provide all the care that's necessary to treat or cure your neuroendocrine tumor. And so you have to be at a center where a team of experts are available to help you with your disease. The good news is that even though there are only about 12,000 diagnoses per year, there are over 175,000 people living with neuroendocrine tumors at this very time. And so that means that a lot of our new diagnoses patients will be alive for a long time. And even if we can't get to a cure, we can often extend life and extend the quality of life for all of our patients. Another reason that it's uh, really important for us to understand nuts and why there's a delay in diagnosis is because these can be very silent killers. Most neuroendocrine tumors are non-functional, so they don't secrete hormones, or if they do, it only happens in very late or advanced stage disease. So these cancers can be asymptomatic or associated with vague symptoms that get missed and get under-treated for a really long time before the neuroendocrine tumor diagnosis is actually made. And because of that, patients will often have disease spread either to the lymph nodes or to the other organs in the body about 50% of the times or even more. And explaining to patients that that in of itself is not a death sentence is really critical. Uh, and so I have up a little bit of information about how that relates to your overall survival. So for example, a patient with a pancreatic neuroendocrine tumor is likely to be alive at five years if their disease is only in the pancreas about 93% of the times. The likelihood of being alive at disease decreases if there's a, a disease in the lymph nodes or if it's spread outside of, of the lymph nodes and into perhaps the liver. Similarly for gastric or GI neuroendocrine tumors, the five-year survival rate is much higher in patients that have disease only within the bowel but even with distant spread, we have relatively good survival at five years, uh, which is 67%. And so one of the other things that I tell my patients is that they can't really look online for their specific disease until they understand what they have. And this is a conversation I have quite commonly in patients that especially have like pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors, where they may Google pancreas cancer, and the data and the information regarding that is vastly different and much more dismal than patients that come in with a pancreatic neuroendocrine tumor diagnosis. So I get to give a lot of hope and often good news even within a diagnosis of advanced cancer uh, for the patients that are coming to my clinic. Another question I get from my patients is how will my neuroendocrine tumor behave? Am I gonna be one of those patients that's gonna be alive at five years even after surgical resection? 
And so I always have a preliminary conversation about how we can somewhat predict how tumors are going to behave. So tumor grade is really important and understanding what tumor grade is and how it relates to your diagnosis is really important. Low grade tumors or grade one tumors have cells that are dividing at a relatively low rate and they're sort of termed slow growing. Oftentimes patients will come in with low grade tumors that have probably been there for years and years, if not decades. And those tumors, even when there is distance spread, uh, can still be very adequately treated with surgery and with uh, medical management. Higher grade tumors like intermediate grade tumors and high grade tumors, which are grades two and three, have cells that are dividing a little bit more rapidly. And so these can be more challenging to treat When you see a low-grade tumor, that's always a harbinger of good biology, and I think it gives us a little bit of reassurance about being very aggressive about surgical resection and medical management with the hopes of getting us to extended life and a good quality of life. The other thing that every patient needs to know about is their tumor differentiation. Well-differentiated cells uh, basically look more like normal cells, whereas poorly differentiated cells are very atypical. And poorly differentiated cells are much more aggressive and much more likely to fail surgical intervention. And so in that case, we really try to leave surgery for either a later stage or even not at all, because these tumors tend to respond better to medical management or systemic treatments. Understanding the combination of both of those things is really important. So a well-differentiated tumor that's grade one will in general have a much more indolent course And so uh, surgery and multiple surgeries may actually be implemented to increase survival, uh, decrease symptoms, and increase quality of life. How will I know if surgery will benefit me? This is a really common question. And I tell patients, again, it depends on your tumor. We just talked about the importance of grade. We also talked about the importance of tumor differentiation. But the other part that's uh, also critical is the stage of disease and the volume of disease. And one of the most important things for me as a surgeon is trying to figure out how much disease is is present and where is the disease present. Even in the setting of distant metastasis, we can often uh, achieve either a cure or a, a significant debulking of the tumor disease, depending on where the tumor is located. Uh, This does sometimes often require multivisceral resections, which means that we're operating on multiple organs in a body and the complexity of the surgery will be a little bit higher. Uh, But for a lot of patients, especially young and healthy patients, this can be tolerated quite well with minimal morbidity in the hands of somebody that does these operations very frequently. The other point that I think every patient should know is that none of the decisions about surgery or medical management should be made in isolation. A single physician should never manage your neuroendocrine tumor, really requires a team approach. So a surgeon, medical oncologist, interventional radiologist, other radiologists, um, and so many other people will be a part of the team that manages this disease. And I always think that a surgeon, especially at the time of diagnosis, is really critical because trying to decide how much liver volume is too much or how much liver volume is safe for resection should probably come from a surgeon as well. I see a handful of patients every year that were never evaluated by a surgeon that have very treatable and possibly curable disease. Um, who just have not been referred to a surgeon. And so surgery was never part of their their treatment algorithm. And we've been able to convert those patients to surgery and improve not just quality of life, um, but certainly length of life uh, in the right hands. The other thing that I talk to patients about is the fact that neuroendocrine tumors can be anywhere in the body. They're most frequently located in the small intestine. About 55% of neuroendocrine tumors are going to be what we call GI carcinoids. About 20% of neuroendocrine tumors are going to be uh, located in the pancreas primarily. And then about 20 to 25% are going to be tumors that are centered or began in the lung or bronchus. What that means is that the surgical expertise that you need is going to be highly specific to your tumor. So there are some surgeons that will do small intestine surgery, but not pancreas surgery. And so you need to understand where your tumor is so that you can get the very best person that's capable to do your operation. 
I happen to do uh, cancers of the abdomen. So I do liver resections, pancreas resections, small bowel resections, colon resections, but I'm not a chest surgeon. So if I see a patient with a lung uh, neuroendocrine tumor, even though I absolutely enjoy treating those patients, if they need a surgery in the chest, I'm not the best individual for them. I think this is particularly important for patients that need liver resections and pancreas surgeons. Those two organs especially require additional expertise in the foregut. And again, an expert should be sought for, for those two lesions. The overall goals of my neuroendocrine surgery every time are to do the same things. I want to remove the tumor. I also want to get some healthy tissue right around it to ensure that we have gotten as many of the cancer cells as possible. We call that resection with a negative margin. We want to minimize a debility, alleviate symptoms, and offer a cure whenever possible. For localized neuroendocrine tumors, which are tumors that are only in existence in the place that they started, Surgery alone is often a very effective treatment. And so these patients will typically have surgery and then we survey them for a, a possibility of recurrence. But typically in well-differentiated low-grade tumors that are localized, no additional therapies are needed after surgery. In the setting of regional or distant disease, which means that's disease that's spread to the lymph nodes or to the other organs like the liver, while surgery is still a mainstay in, in low-grade, well-differentiated neuroendocrine tumors, some additional medical therapies are often required after surgery to either lower the risk of recurrence and also to extend life or to lower the symptoms from your neuroendocrine tumor. Even whenever we cannot completely remove a tumor, sometimes a debulking surgery is recommended. And this is specifically effective in patients that have tumors that secrete functional hormones or that have carcinoid symptoms. So in a debulking surgery, what we try to do is remove as much of the tumor as possible. Our goal is to get to 80% or more to try to decrease the risk of symptoms and minimize the hormone production for patients that have neuroendocrine tumors. And while the goal here is not a cure, it still does often extend life and improve symptoms for patients. In some patients, the tumor may be rather large uh, at the time of presentation or in a really tricky location. And sometimes we have to use what we call a new adjuvant approach, which is where we give a systemic treatment or a medication up front to try to decrease the size of the tumor or cause it to pull away from critical structures, or just to simply make sure that we have good control of the disease before we do a big operation and it makes the surgery much safer and much more feasible in a lot of those cases. And lastly, while your surgeon is really critical for your surgical uh, resection of your neuroendocrine tumor, other members of the team, especially your anesthesiology team, also are really critical. In my patients with metastatic disease who have had carcinoid syndrome, the surgery itself and the general anesthetic does put you at risk of developing carcinoid crisis. And so an anesthesiologist who is aware of this problem and knows how to mitigate it is pretty critical. Briefly, just to talk about a few of the adjuncts to surgery, these are additional therapies that we will use to um, maximize the effects of surgery and minimize the risk of disease coming back. Again, this widely varies depending on your tumor, your tumor grade, and its location. Um, so somatostatin analogs, chemotherapy, targeted therapies like everolimus, immunotherapy drugs, and of course, uh, peptide receptor radionucleotide therapy can all be employed in addition to surgery to try to maximize overall survival for patients and to decrease any symptoms uh, from our neuroendocrine tumors. Summarizing, nets are rare. And because they're so rare, you need to see someone who treats this disease often to ensure that you have the very best outcome that's possible. Teamwork makes the dream work. It really does require multidisciplinary collaboration and multidisciplinary communication to ensure that the patient is always at the center of all of our goals. Surgeons are critical members of your team and you wanna like your surgeon because you're gonna have a lifelong relationship I absolutely enjoy seeing my long-term survivors for neuroendocrine tumors whenever they come into my clinic. It really reminds us of why we went into this and we get to catch up socially on all the things that they've done since my, my first surgery. So hopefully that helps. And again, thank you so much for the opportunity to talk to you guys today.